So as a, as a brief introduction, I know I've, um, oh my god, I'll deal with this later. Um, so Rob, I mean, may, maybe we'll do a little introduction of himself, but um, has done many, many impressive things in the world of software engineering over a long period of time, from um, Bell Labs working in the Unix team, um, working on things like Plan 9, UTF-8, and then um, worked on the Go language in a small team at Google. And we're just really lucky to have someone like this to present to us um, on his experiences in software engineering. So I'm going to hand it over to Rob. He's going to present for about an hour, give or take. We'll do the Q&A for those of you who posted their questions in the forum. Thank you very much. And then we will finish off the last part of the lecture on our regularly scheduled boring content with the HTTP um, lecture in TypeScript. So without further, um, Rob, thank you very much. Thank you, Dick. Now, switch me in here. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, they're very sweet. Yeah, here we go. OK, and this should work. Yes. OK. Uh, so uh, just that those of you who don't know much about me, let me just quickly say why I have the right to be here. Um, I've been doing programming for, well, since the 60s, so we're talking almost 60 years now. Um, I was at Bell Labs Research for many years. Sorry, I'm just going to turn a mic on so they can hear you oh. in, the, in the back. That okay, that's like microphone. Yeah, maybe if you could okay. just. So this is the in-room mic? Yep. Okay, yep. I'll just And I'm just going to fix this camera thing. You keep. Uh, I was at Bell Labs for about 20 years working with the Unix group, although I did not write the original Unix. I certainly contributed to it later. Um, we did all kinds of interesting stuff there. Probably the thing you've used of mine the most is Ken Thompson and I designed UTF-8, which is how all the text in the world is encoded on the internet. And when I say all, I mean like 99.9% .9 now. It's pretty cool. Uh, I was at Google for a number of years, where I did a mostly infrastructure work. Build I designed a storage system under Google and a bunch of other important things I probably shouldn't talk about um, for business reasons. M things I've done publicly that have come along is I did the Blit, which was the first uh, bitmap window system for Unix. Uh, came out before the Macintosh first came out. An editor called Sam, which is an interesting editor. It was the first one ever to have infinite undo, which is now considered sort of standard for good editors. Um, a thing called Acme, which is too strange to go into here, but it's pretty interesting follow on to Sam. The Plan 9 operating system, which defined a whole bunch of things that have actually been largely recreated in Linux at this point. Um, and uh, you mentioned UTF-8 and, of course, the Go programming language, which we developed at Google to deal with the fact that the programming languages we were using, like Java and C++, were not really well suited to the business of writing what we today call cloud software. And Go is now pretty much the language for cloud. So that's pretty cool. But I'm actually trained as a physicist, but I do now call myself a software engineer. Um, so then the question you should probably ask is, what is a software engineer? And actually, that's not an easy question to answer. Um, a lot of people think that if you're a programmer, you're a software engineer. And I don't think that's true. It's not sufficient. It's like saying, because I can write a sentence, I'm a novelist. It's a different thing. Um, now, there's a field called software engineering, which has textbooks. And for many years, the textbooks were all about how to manage a team and build good quality software from a group of individuals of varying skill levels and make sure you got good stuff out. And that's a very important thing. That used to be what software engineering meant pretty exclusively. Um, and there used to be a job called systems analyst, which was someone who worked as a sort of senior programmer type in a company helping drive the projects and the products and make things happen and figure out what went wrong when it didn't and things like that. And I think today, when I say the word software engineer, and by today I mean today uh, in this lecture, um, that's kind of closer to what I mean. It's somebody who's sort of higher up, up all this, not the manager, someone with real technical skill, doing real work, but not necessarily spending all their time programming. Um, and so for the sake of argument, let's call this someone who builds software, which is not, I'm not saying it's a programmer. It's someone who builds software. And I first heard it used this way actually when I got to Google, because I used to call myself a programmer. But at Google, they, the job title was software engineer. And I kind of got used to it. With, I didn't really think about it. But it is a little different from the managerial aspect. And it's an interesting term, because it's got these two words that are kind of Vague, software and engineer. So what is the difference between building software and programming? Now notice I didn't say a software engineer is someone who programs. I said a software engineer is someone who builds software. Well, the difference is what we call engineering. So I'm going to tell you a story. This will take a few minutes, and it won't sound like it's relevant until the end. But please bear with me. 
How many of you know who Charles Proteus Steinmetz was? It's going to be nobody, right? He's one of the most important men of the 20th century. He was good friends with Einstein, with Tesla, with Edison. He is the reason the lights are on in this room, because he figured out how three-phase power works and how it should be used to do transmission of power. He was head of re uh, research and development at uh, General Electric in the United States, one of the biggest electrical companies in the early days. He'd probably be ha unhappy about that flickering light there. Um, and he was basically a genius. He was, he was up there with all those men. For some reason, he's just not as well known anymore, which is a shame, because he made amazing contributions to the world. He was also the first person ever to make an artificial lightning bolt, which sounds like a pretty cool thing to have on your resume. And also, just because it's interesting, he was four foot tall. He was a dwarf. He had very bad hunchback, very bad hip dysplasia. He chain smoked cigars. But he was very gregarious and very well loved. He never had a family of his own exactly. But one of his protégés he liked so much, he adopted him as a son. And they had this big family, all lived together in this amazing farm up in Schenectady, New York, where he pretty much defined electricity for the modern world. He was a pretty amazing guy. Now, around that time, factories, we're talking like 19 teens and 20s, factories in the world were converting from using water wheels and steam engines to using electricity to run their plants. And of course, once we had three-phase power as a concept, and if you don't know what that means, look it up. It's pretty interesting. Um, we could transmit power over long distances and use them to run big factories. And Henry Ford was the person who created the first assembly line, assembly line. at least that's one way we think about him. Uh, he's got other problems we're not going to go into. But he built this place um, in Detroit called the River Rouge Assembly Plant. It's a massive building. It's a factory. It's probably bigger than this campus. Enormous, enormous place, the River Rouge thing. And it was all run on electricity. And for the time, that was new and uh, uh, novel. But it had problems. And it had con continuous electrical issues with all of the motors and generators around the place. And so one day, Henry Ford was sort of annoyed, and he called Charles Steinmetz. And anybody who was anybody then had Steinmetz's phone number. He called him up and he said, can you please come and help us figure out why the River Rouge plant is having so much trouble with this electricity? And so Steinmetz got on a train, went from Schenectady to uh, Detroit, and he spent about a week in the factory. And he made a few measurements, and he studied a lot of stuff. Mostly he sat at a desk, and, and you know, he was a mathematician by, by training. And he mostly just sat at a desk and thought and wrote and worked and then compared things. Now, what I'm about to tell you sounds impossible. It sounds ridiculous. But it's very well documented from multiple sources. One, one day after about a week, Steinmetz got up from his desk, picked up a piece of chalk, and walked across the factory floor. And he walked up to one of these generators. These are massive things, right? And they all have multiple coils on them. And he walked up and reached up his little little body, reached up, and on one place, on one of the generators, he put a chalk mark. And then he turned to the technicians, and he said, please remove 16 coils of copper wire from that, co from that coil on that generator. And they did. And it fixed the problem. The, the River Rouge plant then ran flawlessly. And it was amazing, right? I mean, it's just one of those things. How the hell did he do that? Well, he, he worked stuff out. He went home, and he wrote a bill. And he sent it to Henry Ford. And he said, uh, bill for my services, $10,000, which in modern terms is probably more like one or two million. It's a lot of money, but you know, the factory worked. So Ford, though, being a you know, businessman, said, I can't accept this bill. I don't know what you did. I, it's not even an itemized bill. So send a letter back. I'm not paying until you give me an itemized bill. So Steinmetz wrote an itemized bill. It was two lines. Line one, placing chalk mark on generator, $1. Line two. Knowing where to place chalk mark on generator, $9,999, total $10,000. And Henry Ford paid. Now, that's true. It's, it's amazing. Here's the thing about it, though. Why did Henry Ford pay? Well, this thing worked, right? And he couldn't really stiff him. But he paid because that second line is really the truth. Charles Steinmetz was smart enough to figure that out. And Henry Ford is willing to pay for that expertise of understanding how to fix his generator and get his, his system up and running, which is a pretty big deal. It's a lot of money. But the other thing I want you to notice here, because it's really important, actually, there's two things. Number one, he didn't really take it all apart and rebuild it or anything like that. He sat at a desk for most of that week, and he thought, 
and he studied. And he did a lot of arithmetic and mathematics and figured stuff out, which is important. The other point to make is he didn't fix anything. He walked up to the generator and said, this is what you need to fix. And the technicians fixed it. So Henry Ford was not paying Steinmetz to fix the thing. He paid him to tell him what needed to be fixing. That's the difference. And it's really important difference. Technicians build things. Technicians fix things. But engineers, they can do that too. But they know what to build. And they know what to fix. And that's actually much harder and much more important. To pick our field, I think of programmers as coders. But software engineers, are, they engineer, they build, they design, they think, they study, they analyze. They have a, it's a much deeper calling and a much deeper field. It's much more interesting. Um, now today, I'm going to talk about software engineering, generally. Um, I'm, I can't talk about everything that I think is important in it. It's actually become quite a large and complicated world out there, and a lot to know. I'm not going to talk very much about programming, because it's kind of what you're going to get taught anyway. You're going to know it. Um, but I'm going to talk instead mostly about things that are sort of peripheral to programming, but that make software engineering an interesting thing to do, and you know, a profitable thing to do if, if you're lucky enough to get a job in it. Um, it's a job, right? Software engineering, is a, you can get a job from it. But it's better to think of it as a career or a profession. Programming is a job. You know, write me a web page to deliver you know, my credit card receipt or something like that. That's just work. It's tedious, right? But understanding how a big computing system operates and debugging it and managing and maintaining it and keeping it running, uh, updating it with new ideas coming in, that is a much more interesting thing to do. And that takes a profession and a level of skill uh, and experience to do well. That is much more than knowing how to write a linked list or you know, the binary search. It's a deeper thing. And so the real question here is, how do we understand software? And how, what is it? You know, how does it function? And then the process of making it is clearly important, because you don't just create it a priori and have it work. So the place to start, I think, is to ask the question, what is good software? What makes software good? Because if you're a good engineer, you're going to do good things. And that means the products you make are going to be good. So what is good software? And I think no one's going to argue with me that one of the most important things about it is it has to work. So I want you guys to do an experiment. Just in your head, I think you understand type, you're learning TypeScript in this class, right? Do, you, do any of you know Python? I'm going to do it in Python because I'm better at it. It's, it's trivial. Python's really easy. If you know PyScript, Python or TypeScript, it's fine. It doesn't matter. In your head, I want you to just think about writing a program, actually a function, that does one thing. It adds three numbers together. OK? Just returns the result of summing its three arguments that come in as numbers. So if you give it one, two, and three, you get six back. You can probably write that in your heads. I hope you can if you're this part of your career. Anyone think they have trouble figuring out how to do that? OK, now look at that program in your head. Think about it. Is it correct? Does it get the right answer? Does anyone think their program might not get the right answer? All right, let's see if, let's try something. Uh, this is Python, right? Three, yeah, OK. Pardon? That's an editor. Oh, I want to be down here. OK, this is Python. I think I just want Python. OK, now, uh, so if I say 1 plus 2 plus 3, it prints 6, right? I think you guys figure out Python's probably pretty easy to do, right? So let me write a function to do this, sum of a, b, c. And I say return a plus b plus c. There's a function, OK? Anybody think that might be incorrect? No? Good. Let me try it. One, two, three. What should the answer be? Come on, you can do it. Yay! OK, how about this? What is the sum of 0 0.5, 0 0.2, and 0.1? Anyone? Is that what you thought? It wasn't, was it? Why is it? this number. Why isn't it 0.8? Should have been 0.8, right? The sum of those three numbers is 0.8. This program is incorrect. I just wrote a one-line function that's incorrect. How is that even possible? Well, first of all, it's possible because floating-point numbers are horrible. They're part of life. Python, TypeScript, JavaScript, 
they all worked in floating point. And floating point has all these horrible properties that you have to understand to be an engineer in software. I'm, and so if you don't know what floating point is, you're not familiar with it, please, please look it up and learn about it. There's great web pages describing what you need to know about floating point. But that's not really my point here. My point is I can write a one-line function that's obviously correct and is incorrect. So how the hell am I going to write a 10,000 line or 100,000 line program and make it correct? How is it even feasible? The, and what's missing here is when I said write a function that adds three numbers, I didn't give you nearly enough information. I didn't say add three 32-bit integers or add three floating point numbers. I just add three numbers. What you're lacking is a decent specification for what I was asking you to do. If I had said write a function add three floating point numbers, then the example I showed you would have actually been correct. But it gets harder, because what if I said add three integers? That's pretty easy, too. But then what if I give you the maximum possible integer in it that fits in the word of the machine? You can get an overflow. It might not work. So even then, it's tricky. So I can specify exactly what I want, but even that isn't enough, because we come to another issue here. The sign says, don't, don't bring drinks in here, but I have to drink when I'm talking, sorry. Um, we have to talk about reliability, which is not just whether the program is correct, but is it reliable? Can I trust it to give me the correct answer or let me know it can't? So for the in example of integer overflow, you all understand what integer overflow is, right? I hope you had two big numbers that doesn't fit the overflows. A program that adds two numbers it can overflow, has to, you have to decide, is it okay if it overflows? Or will it maybe trap if it overflows or crash? Will it tell me? Reliability is not just whether it's correct or not. It's whether it's correct under all the circumstances that it is possible to be correct. And lets me know in the cases when it is not possible to be correct. Reliability is one of the most important properties of a piece of software. I don't care, if I'm going to write a program to manage a bank account, and I want, I want to be correct, absolutely, right? That's really, really important. I can probably specify exactly what it means to make it correct. But that specification also has to say what, what to do if you can't do it. What if the customer's account is locked? What if the values are invalid? What if the balance isn't present? What if the network connection breaks in the middle of trying to do the update? You have to make sure that you don't screw up that person's bank account. That's a reliability question, which is quite separate from correctness and is really important. And I find it, there's a way to think about reliability that's really easy to think about, not necessarily hard to do well. But a piece of reliable software will never succeed incorrectly. That is, it will never run to completion and then say, uh, here's the answer, but it's wrong and it knows it's wrong. Which means, for instance, if it's playing with your bank account and there's something wrong with the account or the database, it doesn't say, I'll just give them some money, we'll figure it out later. You can't do that, right? You have to stop and say, I'm sorry, I can't fix it. The other thing it should never do is fail silently. If you say, I want to do this update to my bank account, and it works, great. But if it's not possible to work, the thing to do is to tell the customer or the user, I'm sorry, I can't do this for whatever reason. And tell me, you didn't do it, and as much as possible, why you couldn't do it. And it has to be a helpful message. And I don't want ever to see any of you ever in your life present a user with a stack trace back. Never, never do that. Give them messages that explain what went wrong, not here's how my code didn't work. No one cares about your code. They, ca they care about what you're doing when you're running that code. But anyway, the key point is you need these three things for a piece of software to be even remotely good. It has to be correct as much as you can be. It has to be well specified so that you can prove it's correct. Because you can't talk about correctness if you don't know what the program is supposed to do. And then within the realms of possibility, it's as reliable as it can be. And when it's not possible to work correctly, it lets you know and stops. If you guys walk out of here today and there's the only three things you remember, you will probably have success with software engineering. But saying that, it's remarkable how few people a few people in, that I've worked with really get these at a deep level because it's actually hard to do all these things well. There's one more thing you've got to get out of a piece of software, though, and that is it has to be maintainable. Now, if you've got a one-line program to add three numbers, I think I can manage to maintain that. But then I wake up tomorrow and I want to suddenly add pi and e to a billion digits. That program isn't adequate anymore. 
something's very different is going on. And that suddenly becomes a very large and difficult program. And over time, that program may get modified more and more. It may have to do you know, more than three arguments or a dozen arguments, or it may need to deal with you know, adding decimal currency accurately and not get rounding errors in the pennies. That, and over time, working on that program will cause it to change. And if the program is maintainable, those changes will be easier to implement and easier to work with. Maintainability is about the fact that software changes over time. The num you write a program today, and, you, and we're not talking about university life, we're talking about real, real outside software engineering, you know, powering the world. What, today you build this thing and it works, but tomorrow the customer wants something else, new features, right? Or there's bugs that come in. Well, fixing those bugs changes the code. That's a change to the code. Do the, is the new change maintainable? The hardware can change underfoot. You can move from one processor type to another. Does it still work when you do that? That's called portability. The kind of users you have work. You write a program that works here, and it was great, but then someone goes to Indonesia, and all of a sudden, it doesn't work with the Indonesian language anymore. Well, that's a change you've got to make in the code. So can the code be modified so it can handle non-English? Um, can the, what about external components? You're working in TypeScript here. You borrow some library from the web, and then tomorrow it turns out that, that, li that library is broken. It has a security bug or something. Can you adapt your code to work with that? These changes are all things that software engineers deal with every day. And finally, the biggest and the hardest one is scale. You write a web page that works for 20 people, 20 customers simultaneously. That's fantastic. Your company takes off, and now you've got a million. Can your program handle a million simultaneous connections? Probably not. What do you do about that? You have to do some engineering. And the other thing that changes over time is the people who work on it. If you write a piece of code today and you think it's great, you love it, and you put it on your shelf, and then you come back six months later because you want to change something, add a feature, you are not the same person who wrote that because you've learned things, you've changed things, you've forgotten things. And so you're now looking at a piece of code that isn't as familiar to you anymore as it used to be. And that's just a simple example. The teams, we're going to team of programmers. I mean, many other people, they come and go. So the people who work on a piece of software change over time as well. And that also affects the maintainability. I'm going to talk quite a bit about that a little later. And so the way to think about this is the software, you know, if you build a, a boat, the boat is a boat. It floats, it doesn't float, it's a boat, right? You build a piece of software, it could change over time and almost certainly will. And it helps to think of software not as a static thing, but as a living thing, something that changes and evolves as it goes through its world. And Titus Winters, who was a colleague of mine at Google, has this lovely quote. He says, software engineering is programming integrated over time. And I think that's a really good way to summarize it if you know calculus. <laughs> um, but it's not perfect, and we'll come back to that, what, what's missing from this, from this uh, uh, slogan. So if software's a living thing, it means it has a lifetime. So what does a software lifetime look like? What happens through time to software? Well, this is, in the old textbooks, they used to talk about a thing called the waterfall model, which is the way they used to think about software engineering as a management discipline. And it looks a little bit like this. And there's some truth to this, but, but it's not very complete. But just so you know what's involved. Writing a piece of software isn't just writing a piece of programming. It is you have to specify what you're going to make or what you want someone else to make. Then the coding has to happen. Then you have to debug it and test it and do all the other goody stuff. Then you've got to make sure it really honors the specification you have, called quality assurance, that's robust and reliable. Um, you have to document it. Documentation is never appreciated by the people who have to write it as much as it should be. Um, then you give it to the customers, and the customer says, this is great, but, and all of a sudden you're back at the beginning again. Oh, we've got to change specification, we've got to change the program, we have to debug it again, we have to write new tests. And it's a continuous thing. Now, the mistake in the waterfall model, which is kind of like one run through this, is when you drop off the bottom, you're done. But not only is that not true, all of these things could be going on simultaneously, but different parts of the system could be, under, could be every one of these stages at the same time. You could be simultaneously getting a new specification coming in the door while you're coding a feature and your, your colleague's fixing a bug and the documentation has to be updated. All these things can be happening simultaneously, and they will be happening simultaneously on a big project. So software is this living thing. It's always changing, and you're always working with changing it. Now, most of the things on here are probably relatively familiar, but I'm going to talk about a couple of things where speaking as, you know, 
an old fart, as they used to call ourselves. There's a couple of things about, about on this chart that I want to focus on for a minute. One of them is debugging. How many people here like to, like to debug? Good. Debugging is part of this job. If you don't like debugging, get up and go, because there's no point in doing a job that you're going to spend a lot of your time debugging if you don't like debugging. It's a mindset. You have to treat yourself to the idea that debugging is part of the story, and it's an interesting challenge. If you, you can learn to enjoy it. Keep well, going. Yeah, I just need to fix something okay. with the camera, so I keep you, going. You can, um, you can treat it as a challenge. It's a puzzle. It's a fun puzzle. I am an OK programmer. I'm a really good debugger. Um, I have a friend who I worked with for many years who is a way better programmer than I am. He's amazingly good. But he's a terrible debugger. And the reason is he looks at a piece of code, and it's usually beautiful because he's a really, really good programmer. But it's broken because that's why he's looking at it. And he cannot see what the program is doing. He can only see what he wants it to do. He believes, he reads the code for his intention rather than what it actually does. And so he'd call me over, and I'd stare at the screen, and I'd say, what does this line do? And he'd say, it says, you know, do this. I said, actually, it doesn't. It says do that. He'd say, oh, you're right. And then he'd be off to fix. So it's really important to understand debugging is part of the story, and it needs a certain mindset brought to it. And if you think you write a program and it doesn't work right away, you've failed somehow. You haven't. You just haven't finished the process. Debugging is a huge part of software engineering. Now, let me tell you the one true fact about bugs. And it's, honestly, it sounds trivial, but I think it's kind of profound. You have, you're working on a program, or some customer's reporting something to you, and there's a bug. What's the one thing you know for a fact? You know for a fact that that bug happened. The program was supposed to print 27, and it, or 0.8, and it didn't. It printed something else. That is a fact. And whatever that fact tells you is really important to figure out why it happened. You start from the fact that the failure occurred and what that failure tells you about the work. And I could go on for a whole hour about how to debug. But if you start from the idea that I don't trust anything anymore except that this one fact it presents to me, which is a failure of this code to do what it's supposed to do, then I can probably, by focusing on that, get back to the thing that happened. Um, and if you think about Steinmetz's story, the fact was that the factory wasn't working properly. And he just started from that. Why isn't it working? What could possibly be going on? Analyze, analyze, analyze. And he walked over and made the chalk mark. And a lot of bugs are like that. You can spend hours tearing your program apart and rewriting it and blah, 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 all of which might be necessary. But sometimes you can just stare at the screen for five minutes and think about what that fact is telling you. And you go, oh, I know where I, know where I made that mistake, and fix it. Um, big story, small summary. The other thing I want to talk about is testing, um, because testing is also, who likes to write tests? OK, a few more. Maybe you're just being nice to me. Why do you write, you, you put your hand up. Why do you write tests? Because I'm too lazy to catch everything manually every time. That, that's a good answer. That's a very good answer. It's close to the right answer. Um, obviously, you test because you want to make sure your software works. If you write a program and then just hand it over the wall without making sure it's correct, all kinds of hell can break loose. But that's not the most important reason why we write tests. Anyone know what the most important reason is? It's so you know it continues to work. Remember, we're talking about the maintainability of software. You're going to change things in the program. You're going to add things, delete things, ch change bugs, fix code, add things. Things are going to change inside the code. And if you have a good test suite, every time you make a change, you can run that test suite and the test suite can tell you, you know what, you haven't screwed up yet, which is a really powerful thing to have. You can do massive refactorings of huge code bases. And if you have a good test suite, then the tests are going to tell you when you made a mistake. And there are pieces of software that I've worked on that I wouldn't, wouldn't go near if it wasn't for this tremendous test suite to make sure that it keeps working as I make these huge changes. It is actually the single most important thing to understand about testing. And it's, again, it's different between programming and engineering, right? An engineer thinks of tests as a guarantee that at this point in time, this test passes. And so later, if it fails, either somebody's made a mistake in the code or the test needs to be changed. And that, a tremendous amount of work goes into 
in real production software, making sure that the tests cover all the cases that can happen and can be used to guarantee long-term reliability. Another thing tests are really good for like this, you move to a new operating system or a new version of an operating system, a new architecture, and you run the tests again. And having those tests will tell you, you know what, that transition worked, we're fine. Or all of a sudden, because something changed underneath, this thing doesn't work anymore and you can fix it. So software is a living thing and tests are the thing that makes sure it's alive. Now that's sort of one on, you know, think of one person working on their thing, doing their business, writing a code, test, debugging, so on. But a huge part of software engineering is the fact that it's a team effort. Now there's certainly projects of significance that are run by one person and maintained by one person forever. But even such projects, if they have any success, there are users out there and the users are reporting problems. And they're part of the world of that software. It's very, very rare that an interesting piece of software has only one person ever who works on it. Because software engineering is a social endeavor. It's actually kind of a, a fun group project. And so I've taken Titus Winter's idea that software engineering is the integral of programmer time, and I've extended it. Software engineering is the double integral of programming over time and people. And what do I mean by that? Well, when you write a piece of software, who are you writing it for? You're probably writing it for the person, well, you're writing it for your boss maybe, maybe for you personally if you're lucky enough to be in that position. But you're also writing it for the person who's going to use it, which may be you, it may be somebody you've never met, maybe somebody on the other side of the world. Right? You're doing that, that's for sure. But you're also writing the software for the other engineers on your team because they're going to look at it. They're going to work on it with you. They're going to report bugs in it. They're going to write documentation for it. They're going to read your documentation for it. And so don't think of the programming problem as something that you're doing just for the other people. You're also doing it for the, your own local team, your crowd. And remember that example I gave you earlier. The person you are six months from now is not the same as the person you are today. So think of that person in the future as what your team member as well. If you go to a real you know, big company, work on a big project, you know, a million line code, or something like Chrome, which is more like a billion lines, um, the number of people who worked on that is enormous. And for, over the span of you know, a year or two, the complete population of engineers working on it can turn over almost completely. And so that, that energy inside the, inside the system, inside the team, is really important as an aspect of what you have to think about when you're writing software. And this brings us back to that other definition. Remember I said that it used to be that software engineering meant a sort of management discipline. How do you manage a team to build software for you? Well, we're kind of back to that again. You know, you, we were the programmers who did build software, but now we're also interacting with the people around us that, on our team. And so we have to manage what we're doing with respect to what they're doing. They're making changes that might interact with us. Working, we're making changes that are going to interact with them. We want to coordinate that. That's a management exercise, right? You're also working with the peers from before, you know, last year, because they're the ones who wrote this. And I'm interacting with what they did. So they're kind of my old team. And the stuff you're doing today is going to be looked at by somebody a year from now. So there's a future team that's also going to be working on this. And all of these different groups are part of what makes that software live. You need to understand that to make that succeed requires respect. You have to respect the people who wrote the old code. They may have made a mistake. Maybe they didn't mean to. Or maybe just the world has changed and the code doesn't do what it needs to do anymore. But don't, don't look at the old code and go, oh, God, you, you guys are jerks. You know what you're doing. Maybe they did. Maybe things have changed or they weren't aware of what was different. Or maybe you're wrong and they were right. So f take respect into that thing. Respect the people around you and what they're doing because they're trying to make their world work. Respect the people for the future. What you're doing today is going to affect what their future life is. And so make sure you respect it for them so that they have it. And that respect can be interpersonal, but it can also be in the code. What does that mean? It means there's a concept that we call readability, which is the ability to understand what a piece of software, a program, is doing. Now, long ago, we're going to, I'm going to show you a nice example later. Long ago, programmers were relatively cheap, computers were relatively expensive, every cycle counted, programs were really small and tight and difficult to write, and it was a real learning experience to get up and running and that stuff. And the code tended to be very kind of opaque and cryptic 
And there was kind of a cult of the cleverest, smartest, coolest way to make something happen. And we learned a lot going through that. But when you're working on a billion line code base, and I, when I say billion, I mean billion, you can't really do that. You can't have a billion lines of cleverness because nothing will be understandable. Readability is the ability to look at a piece of code and understand it so that you can know what it's doing and know whether you need to change it or want to change it or can be capable of changing it. And I think readability is more important than correctness. It's more important than reliability. It's more important than performance. It's more important than any other property of a piece of software. Because if the code is readable but incorrect, I can probably fix it because I can understand it and see what's wrong. If the code is readable but unreliable, I can probably find the re reliabilities and fix them. Right? But if the code is unreadable and, and correct, it might not be correct tomorrow because something could break. And if it's unreadable, I'm not going to be able to fix it because it's going to be too hard. Readability is the most important property of a piece of software, which means when you are writing software, don't try to be clever. Be clear, be straightforward. If you have to do something clever, and sometimes you do have to for whatever reason, explain it. Put a really good comment in saying why you're not doing this some dumb way, why you're doing it the clever way, so that someone who comes along has a chance of understanding. My friend Brian Kernahan has this lovely quote where he says, when I, if I write a piece of code that's so clever, it's right on the limit of my understanding and it makes me really happy, when I have to debug it later, I have to be smarter than that and I won't be. I'll be stupider and I won't be able to understand anymore. I went through all that. Yes, readability enables everything good. So. You're, when you look at a piece of software, if it looks like it's hard to understand, the person who has written that code has not done that job properly. It just, it's just the truth. Okay? Um, which brings us to testing again. Did I just skip debugging again? No, doing it's coming out. Testing again. When you're, when, when you're writing tests and you think about readability, right, you want the test to be easy to understand as well. Not just the program it's testing, but the test itself. Because same thing, the test breaks in the future, the person who has to fix that test or fix the program so the test passes again has to understand the test. So it's got to be clear and simple. And then think about this. Imagine you are the person who has to fix a bug that's been caught by a failing test. And the test says broken, one word. That's completely hopeless. Right? But what if the test says, here's what happened, here were the inputs to the, the test I was running, here are the outputs I got, I should have gotten this number, but I got that number instead. Chances are you're going to have a lot easier time figuring out what to fix and why it broke. So when you're writing a test, think about it socially. Think about who is going to have to work on that test or the code that fixes that test. And imagine helping them. It might be you and you'll thank yourself later. A lot of the testing libraries, you probably bounced off some of them, tend to violate this principle. They just say, you know, a uh, test was supposed to get three and got four. It doesn't really tell me anything. And you know a lot more about what were the inputs, what were the outputs, what was the environment, how did it happen? So helpful tests are more important than just having tests and because they're not helping the program, they're helping the programmers, the software engineers, understand what's going on. Which brings us to debugging. Again, when you you know, sometimes you're fixing a bug, but quite often you're the recipient of a bug report. Now think about the recipient of that bug report. Someone, a user mails in and says, your program sucks, I can't make it work. What are you supposed to do, right? Even if they say, you know, I, I, ran, I, ran, my, I ran your library on my inputs and it didn't work. Well, what are your inputs? What was supposed to happen? Give me the author of this problem I have to solve enough information that I can understand what happened. A good bug report or issue report is one of the most valuable things you can create inside a computer environment because it, it is telling someone who has to fix it everything they need to know to be able to actually track it down with a minimum of fuss. So think of the person receiving the bug report, even if it's going to be you, so that when the time comes to fix it, all the information they need is there. It's got a title. 
you know, uh, got, got weird answer adding three numbers. It tells you the environment. What was the CPU type? What was the operating system? What was the version of the operating system? What environment variables were set? What libraries were you using? Can you give me a self-contained example that illustrates the problem? I've got a, that Python script. I've got a two-liner. It tells you it gives the wrong answer. You could make a nice bug report for that. It wouldn't get fixed, but you could give that nice bug report. What did you expect to happen? If you tell me I got 27 and it shouldn't, that doesn't help. What, do you, what were you expecting, 28 or 26? Tell me what you expected. Tell me what you actually got and include with it what I call assets. Like imagine you're working on a graphics library. Can you give me the image that was created or the image file you were trying to process that was giving me the trouble? If you can include any real information to help me understand it, chances are I can do a much better job. Are there logs from the test failures? If it failed because of a test failure, give me the logs from the tests and all the tests. Maybe some of the other tests failed too and those are the real problem, right? So think about writing a bug report for the person who has to receive it and don't think it was a chore you don't want to, ah, this probably doesn't work, but no, 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 off. Give it the proper care of writing it. Most important of all, it's not always possible, but it often is. If you can include a complete program that the recipient of the bug report can run that illustrates the problem, that is huge, especially if it's short. A three or four line program that illustrates the bug is tremendous. And I can't tell you how many hundreds of times a good bug report with a reproducible test example like that becomes an actual test suite member inside the software. Oh, this user gave me this bug. Oh, that's horrible. I can just wrap it up as a test and run the tests. And one of the best ways to fix bugs, by the way, is not to fix the bug, but to write the test that shows the bug happening. And then you just work on the code until the test passes. That's a really, really good way to think about it. And so always include a complete program if possible. It's not always. Something is just too hard. You know. But if you can, it's a huge, huge boon to the person who's fixing it. It gets better. It's about to get interesting. Don't leave now. <laughs> All right. So I mentioned before software engineering is a profession, right? It's kind of a job. You can go to work, you write code, you write documentation, you go to meetings. What, what is the job? What do you do? Right? You're in university now. Some of you probably had real jobs, maybe not all of you. Um, but what happens if you're a professional software engineer? What does it look like? Well, a typical day probably has a lot of things going on. If you're lucky, you might get to write some code. But a more typical day will probably look a little bit more like this. There'll be some study, some research and information gathering. Maybe looking at bug reports, or maybe reading some documentation or specification changes that have come in, or maybe studying some background material you need to know to work on this new thing. There's going to be a lot of interactions with your team. They're really important. What are you working on? What are you working on? Can we work together? Uh, if I do this first, will it interfere with what you're up to? How do we coordinate all that? Some of that may be through mail, some of it in person, some of it messaging and chat. Um, a lot of that goes on. Um, going to lunch with your team is actually a really nice way to keep, in, keep things moving. You're going to spend a lot of time doing code review. By the time you graduate from this university, this august institution, you'll have probably written something like 10,000 lines of code for your degree, maybe more, maybe more. You probably have read, maybe, if you're good at this, 10,000 lines of someone else's code. Okay. When you're in the real world of software engineering, those numbers are way out of skew. If you write 10,000 lines of code in a year for a soft, software engineering job, you're actually pretty productive because there's a lot of other stuff you've got to do. But you're probably going to be reading hundreds of thousands of lines. If you get a job to work on Chrome, for instance, they put you down to desk, say, once you add a feature to Chrome, here's a two billion line code base. Off you go. You're going to spend a lot of time reading code. And one of the best ways to learn about reading code is to do code reviews. Ask your colleagues to say, let me look over your, your code before you submit it so I can find things, learn more about the system it's interacting with, maybe help you find bugs before they land. Code reviews are a huge part of the job. And a bit like debugging, they're kind of a chore, but if you take it the right way as a learning opportunity, they're actually really good. You're certainly going to spend some time debugging many days. Uh, you'll do some coding. I don't know how much. I think for a beginner, you're probably getting 20 or 30% of your day might be coding. Later on, it goes down. Um, there's a friend of mine whose father was in the Air Force, and he got in the Air Force because he wanted to fly. He fought uh, in the Second World War. He was a pilot. 
He was a good pilot, he survived the war, got promoted. He got promoted, he got promoted, eventually became a wing commander or something like that, some very high up level. And every time he went up, he could fly less because he was doing other things that were more important. By the time he got to his top job, he was not allowed to fly. You are too important to fly. And unfortunately, <laughs> in this world, sometimes you can be too high up. You're too important to write code. You should be doing other things. Don't let me scare you off. Um, it happens. Uh, and meetings. Now, there's going to be a lot of meetings. It's life. You're going to have to talk about what the team is doing. There's going to be team meetings, maybe agile scrums and other such trendy things going on. And they're really important to knowing what the team is doing and for the team to hearing about you. Some of those meetings, you are going to be presenting. And therefore, I've got a couple of pieces of advice for you. Which one of them is that you should be prepared to communicate with your team a lot. And in fact, you're only any good at your job in software engineering if you can communicate well. So you should practice writing prose. If you can't write well, you can't communicate to your team what you're working on well. Prose writing is a really important part of this job. Um, you can even do sort of code reviews for writing. Here's, here's the documentation I've written for this package. Would you please review it for me? See if you understand it, agree with it. If I miss something, is there an error in it? Get, you know, could style be better? Find someone on your group who is really a good writer, and they exist, there are a lot of them, but they're not everybody, and ask them to help you learn how to write better. It can be really a good way to, to, to do things. Similarly, you should practice giving presentations. When you go to one of those team meetings and they say, what have you been working on? You're, you're going to have to talk about what you've been doing. And you have to be comfortable standing in front of a room of five, ten, or more people and explaining what you're doing and how it works and why. So practice giving presentations. Practice making slides, just like code reviews. You know, have, help, have a friend or a team member look over your slides, talk to you about them. Practice giving it. Rehearse it. If you're going to talk at a conference, rehearse it. Practice. The better you are at communicating, the more effective you're going to be as an engineer. Right? Volunteer to do these things. If there's a, a job like giving a talk at a conference for your team or writing documentation for a new feature in your team, occasionally volunteer. I'll do that. I'm not good at that, but I'll do it because I'll learn more by doing it. That's a really important, that's a really strong advice. I, I really think you should take that to heart. And another thing you should probably do is understand that because engineering involves a lot more reading than writing, you're going to be learning a lot. In fact, there's a lot of stuff to learn in computing. Um, and one of the things that I find with students who are fresh out of school, even if they're really good programmers and really sharp, they often have fairly large gaps in their understanding of computer science. And I'm talking about computer science, not programming. Do you understand complexity theory? Do you understand parsing theory? Do you understand atomic theory? Not are you an expert who can write a world-leading paper on atomic theory, but you understand what it is. You know what a state machine is. Um, uh, computer science is just a lot more than just programming. Um, and mathematics is much more than arithmetic. It's by the same analogy. Let me tell you a little story about regular expressions. How many of you know what a regular expression is? OK, who can give me a definition of a regular expression? No professors can do it. Someone give me a definition of a regular expression. Nobody? Somebody got his hand up? I can't say. Whoever you are, I can't. I can. Oh, there you are. Yes. What is a regular expression? A regular expression is a pattern matching system meant to mimic regular styles of matching. You're, you're remarkably close, but not quite. And the word regular appeared multiple times in there, which is good. A regular expression is, in fact, a syntactic form that recognizes a regular language. And a regular language is actually a well-defined thing. It's a, it's a language that you can parse in linear time with no look ahead. Um, and I'm not an atomic theory expert, but I have written, I've actually got some interesting early work in regular expressions done in it. Um, the point of, the reason I'm telling you this story is that regular expressions, regular expressions, not reg -ups, regular expressions, have the property that they are guaranteed to be uh, searchable for in linear time in the length of the input, which is a pretty powerful idea. I can give you a million line file and a billion line file. It'll be linear in how long those files are to find the matches for this pattern. Now, we all thought that was a given back in the 70s, 80s. And then what happened was somebody wrote a regular expression library 
which gradually mutated into a thing you probably know of called PCRE. It's equivalent to what's in JavaScript, regular expression engine. It's equivalent to what's in Python, Perl. And guess what? Those regular expression libraries do not implement a regular machine. It is possible to give about a 50-line pattern on a modest file to Python or JavaScript and have it take billions of years to complete the search. Because they've done things to the machine, they not, didn't understand the theory, and they've implemented a machine that cannot, that doesn't run in linear time. It's a huge point. And this, this link I have here, Russ Cox explains this. We were kind of shocked. When we got to Google, we were doing some regular expression stuff for, for searching. It's a long story. It doesn't really matter. But uh, I did, it never occurred to me that PCRE could be super linear. And so I put PCRE into this library that was user facing. And machines were crashing in production because it was running out of memory or blowing up and taking too long, timing out. And I looked into it and found out that PCRE was not regular. It was actually terrible from an automata theory point of view. And there's some amazing work that Russ Cox did to sort of deal with that. Um, but it's really important to understand regex libraries do not implement regular grammars. They are extended in ways that can become extremely slow, even for languages that are matchable regularly. And so it cost us, I don't know, many, probably literally years of work making these, some of these open source libraries come up to speed and back to where they were in the 1970s. So you should really know a little bit about your complexity theory, your automata theory. You should know how to write a parser. If you can't write a regular expression, sorry, if you can't write a recursive descent parser, look it up, learn it. It's really cool, and it'll help you. And then when somebody has a log file they want you to parse, you can say, I know how to do that. It's really easy. Learn the theory. It's not just about programming. There's, there's deep, interesting insights that you should know. Also, you should know your technology. You should know what the world outside that you're working with is doing, what the networks are doing, what the CPUs are doing, how the operating systems work, how the applications connect. Know that stuff. And it changes, too. So be aware of what's coming. Don't learn every new language that comes out just in case. But know it's there. Know what it's good for. Spend an hour reading about some new feature that comes out. Read the computing news once in a while so that you're aware of trends and how the field is changing. It's changed tremendously since I started in this field. Which brings us to a program written in 1974 called Typo. I don't think any of you probably know what it is. Any of you know Typo? It's a really cool program. It was written by Bob Morris, father of the other Robert Morris who wrote the Morris Worm, but that's another story. Um, it's actually the earliest sort of spell checker that I know of. I'm not saying it is the earliest, but I think it's the only one I know of. It's not really a spell checker, though. It's actually a statistical modeling thing. It's really clever. What you do is you give it a corpus, like a dictionary or the Bible or some other on, you know, the UN minutes of a meeting or something like that. And it computes the statistical properties of that corpus. Then you give it a document that you want to see if it has any typos in it. And it looks for words in your document that are statistical outliers compared to the statistics of the corpus. It doesn't know anything about English or whatever else. It knows only what the corpus said. It's actually like an amazing algorithm. It, it finds typos without knowing anything about language, except that language tends to have statistical patterns that it can identify. It's 347 lines of C, and it was written in 1974. And you can actually see the whole program at this link. But I'm going to show you some pieces of it. Now, how many of you are OK with C? You probably can sort of, you'll, you'll figure it out. I'm going to show you some C code. Don't be afraid. It's terrifying C code. Don't be afraid. Here's, here's the manual page. And you can see, just give it a file, a couple of arguments. Notice down here, he says, you know, you can it'll even handle Urdu, which is really funny. Uh, it's the only time Urdu appears in the manual. Um, but you know, you say typo on a file. And by default, it compares it to the dictionary. And it was pretty good at what just happened. No. Uh oh, please, I don't want to break your machine. Why did it crash? Just, just I think the window closed. Bad oh, maybe Chrome crashed. Bad WebSocket origin. Cool. Who wrote this crap? <laughs> <laughs> I think Chrome crashed, yeah. Wow. Well, there you go. Chrome crashed. <laughs> you can. Uh, I, yeah, I, I know what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, we good just there? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. okay. No, it's not just three. Full screen. Okay. You got it. Yeah, let's hope we can get past the there. Okay. You still seeing it there? That was, well, that's in less than software engineering, having Chrome crash. It's pretty cool. Shows you it's real. Okay, here's the man page. This is from 1974. Okay, there we go. We're caught up. All right, here is the first page or so of the code. I have not modified it in any way. It's the line one is line one on this screen. See this comment? Keep these four cards in order. That is the only comment in the entire program. What it's saying, because it doesn't look like it, what's a card? It means tables. These int table, int tab one, int tab two, and chart tab three, those four tables are, have to be in order here because later, I'll show you on the next slide, it's going to just read them in directly in as binary blobs and drop them down on top of those data structures. And in 1974C, you were guaranteed that those things would be adjacent in memory if they were adjacent in the program. And so you could just read this binary blob and drop it in. Right? We don't code like that anymore. That's kind of what I'm talking about here. Pretty weird, right? Uh, here's, here's some code to do some reading. Um, ugly, right? That's, but it works. Uh, this is the processing. It's, it's not formatted right. I mean, there's magic numbers everywhere. Read salt table 21200. Anyone want to guess what 21200 is? It's the length of the file. It's programmed right into the program. Awful, awful, right? We're mocking. This is terrible code. Terrible code. Here is an interesting little bit. This is the meat of the algorithm. Is this a typo code two again? No, I didn't. I should say three. Anyway, um, this is the meat of the algorithm. The line in the middle that says tot equal plus, that's old C. It's, not, it's plus equals now. Uh, the log table is index, blah, 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 blah. That is this beautiful probabilistic thing that's creating this statistical way of counting. Now, the machine it ran on when it was written was a PDP-11. This particular PDP-11 he worked on, I think I actually worked on it myself when I got there, was probably 32 kilobytes of memory. So, you know, nothing. And you're going to read anything like a Bible as the corpus. It's a huge thing. How do you count that many things in a machine with 60-bit integers and 32K of memory? Well, Morris invented a thing which is known now as the Morris counter. And basically what it does is for, you know, if you put one in, it increments the lowest bit. But as you count and the number gets bigger, it only increments according to the probability of how many you've got right now. It's a scaling probability up the bits. And so you can generate this very, this approximation of the value you get if you count it accurately, but store them in a tiny word. It's called the Morris counter, and it's the very first ever streaming counter ever written. Nowadays, people use streaming counters all the time in analyzing web logs and things like that. But this is the first ever streaming counter ever invented. OK? Pretty cool, right? I mean, it's, you can't see it, but trust me, it's cool. There's a paper about it if you want to read about it. It's good, it's good reading. Now, obviously, this is weird code. And I'm not asking you to understand it, but I do want you to look at it. Because this was written in 1974. It's an amazing program. It actually is so amazing. It's a paper about it, and it was even patented. That algorithm is streaming counter. Morse counters were patented in 1974 ish, approximately. Probably patented, probably a year or two later. And we look at it today, and we think there's so many things wrong with this program. It's so non portable. The style is awful. There's no generality. There's one comment which just tells you don't break me. Uh, it's a worthless comment. There is a paper, in fairness, and it's a good paper, but the people who have the code don't have the paper because the paper was never published. But it was original. No one had ever done this before. This is just, I just showed you the pieces of the first spell checker ever written, the first streaming counter ever written in 1974. That's almost 50 years ago. In fact, it's probably written in 73 because it came out in 74. So it's 50 years old. And in fact, I first started using Unix in 1975, which is 48, 48 years ago. So I'm almost as old in this field of, of Unix computing as this thing. A lot has changed. This program, this, this weird looking thing, is not great code. It was never great code. No one looked at this and admired its beauty. But it was kind of typical. This is the way code tended to be written by a lot of people back in the mid 70s. We were still thinking about the density of the code, how efficient it could be, how, you know, we weren't worrying about portability. We weren't worrying about 
safety. We were expecting that the idea of a code being portable hadn't been invented yet, right? You, if you had a Fortran deck, you didn't expect that to run on another machine. It would only run on the machine you wrote it for. So there's a lot about this that's wrong, and by today's eyes looking at this software, you think it's awful. And I agree with you, it's horrible. I, I tried to get this program to compile again. It was just, I couldn't. I ended up writing it and go and starting over. But um, that said, it's not all that much of an outlier for 50 years ago. So think how different you look at programs today, how different they look. All the technologies that are in there now that weren't invented then, some of which, by the way, are based on this. That's how much has changed, which means if you're lucky enough like me to have a 50-year career in computing, you're probably going to be looking at the code today that you're writing, looking at a, a thing like this 50 years on, and thinking, God, that's awful. How did we do that? Things really change. And, but you can make that change better by thinking about software engineering as a process of engineering, of teamwork, of building readable code, maintainable code, testable code, debuggable code and not trying to show off, which is, I hope, something you've been trained out of by now. Things change. Software evolves. The idea of software engineering evolves, right? What it means to have a good piece of software has changed tremendously in 50 years. It's changed in 10 years. 10 years ago, I wrote code differently from the way I do today, because I've learned so much. So what you know and use today may still be around in 50 years, or it might be totally irrelevant, or it might be considered blasphemous. We don't know. So be aware of change, and don't get dogmatic about technology. Think this is the best thing that will ever happen, because something coming tomorrow might just blow it out of the water. So never stop learning, but also don't judge the past. Don't look at this code and think Morris was an idiot. He wasn't, he was a genius. He ended up with deputy director of the NSA. So he's a very smart guy, and, but his co he wrote code at a different standard, and it's important to understand those things change, right? So let me conclude by just sort of telling you what I've been saying all along. Software engineering is not just programming. It's engineering, it is technical, and it's social. That social part is so important. It is a critical piece of modern society. Nothing in the world anymore, pretty much, runs without computers. The biggest manufacturer of computers in the world today is General Motors. All those processors they put in, your, in their cars. Right? The world is, just runs on software. It's a really important field. It's really good to be part of it, and you're very, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting, fulfilling job to have. But think of it as a social thing that's helping the world, helping the people you work with, and treat everything and everybody in it with respect, and you'll have a long and satisfying career. So um, I'll finish there. There's a couple of links for things you might want to take a look at. Um, including the regular expression one. So I can, that's my formal presentation, but I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. That was excellent. Um, all righty. I can share the yeah, yeah, slides here yeah, after this. You'll have, you can you'll have to well, print it with PDF. Yeah, yeah I've got full yeah, access. You <laughs> so, can do it. Okay. So, yeah, like I said a couple of weeks ago, we asked. Um, should probably hide my notes there. We asked some of the students to start, I don't know what this camera's gonna do, it's obsessed with you, <laughs> to, to, to ask some questions and we sort of, I've just sort of done a bit of a ranking based on the number of upvotes and stuff. Okay. So we'll, we'll leave it where we wanna leave it, but depending how much time we've got. But um, all right, so, okay. Heaps of students are wondering about the implications of LLMs, large language models, like mm -hmm. ChatGPT, Copilot, and whatever secret things are going on behind um, industrial doors. Um, so what are your thoughts on these models and software engineering? Are they glorified, expensive, autocomplete, or the potential to significantly disrupt how systems are engineered and what our role is as engineers? Yes, is the answer. To, to both? Or yeah. to <laughs> Look, ironically, I didn't read him time. Back in the 80s, I played a lot with Markov chains, which are predictive mm -hmm. text predictors, right? Well, it doesn't have to be text, it numbers, but I was using them for text. And we were generating you know, English text by reading in text and generating statistics and generating more text. And honestly, these large language models are the same thing. They're much more powerful. But they're basically looking, you know, sucking up the internet and then predicting more, generating more internet. 
they don't have any understanding or any meaning. There's a, you all know what the Turing test is, right? The Turing test doesn't work because people are too gullible. When a chat GPT talks to you and you think you under, it's understanding you, don't be fooled, please. Understand that it's just generating text. And I think of them as pure generative models, but I don't know how to convince the world that they're just text generative models. They aren't knowledgeable, sentient beings. And I think that's a really tricky problem for society. I don't have a good answer for it. Um, I think they're terrifying. Not because I'm afraid of what they can do, but be afraid of, I'm afraid of what people will do with them to, to make things Absolutely happen. Absolutely agreed. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a lot of layoffs happening at the moment in the tech industry, I'm sure you're aware. Um, as computer science, software engineers, and computing engineer graduates, should we be concerned? Well, yeah, you should be concerned, of course. Um, but is it concern you personally? I don't know. I'm, you know, that what happened, the main reason these layoffs are happening, if you ignore Twitter, which is a dumpster fire of its own, the main reason it's happening is that during the pandemic, too many companies thought the whole future was going to be people working at home. And so they ramped up like crazy. And mostly what you're seeing right now is a correction to that. They finally realized, you know, we hired way too much during the pandemic. The, gr the growth we saw in the pandemic, which in some program companies like Zoom and so was massive, is not sustainable. And so they're just dialing back. Now, for your generation, you've never seen this happen before. I Believe me, I've seen it happen several times before. Yeah. Uh, in around 2000, there was the telecom boom, same thing. They thought the world was going to be all telecom crazy stuff. And it happened, and it just all deflated again. So the, it's a it's a boom bust cycle, and you're kind of in a bum, bummed out bust cycle right now. Mm -hmm. But that that has nothing to do with the future. It, it's still a extremely important sector of the economy. There's still tons of jobs. Uh, I have a friend who's laid off, and he said he's never had so many job offers come in. You know, recruiters contact him since he was laid off. Um, and he was laid off not because he wasn't doing his job. He was laid off because he was very well paid and they're trying to save some money. So I think the time for you know, starting out in the field right now is actually pretty good because I predict like every other time in the past, it's happened. It's going to be on an up curve again very soon. So don't let it get you down, even though it is kind of a bum. Yeah. We've got a Golang specific question, <laughs> of course. Um, Wondering what decisions went into the design of generics? It seems different to most languages. What were the decisions that led to the choice? I'm not really the right person to answer that because I didn't do any of that. Um, Ian Taylor and, uh, was the driving force behind it. They're not that different. <clears throat> because most of the languages you've seen with generic interface, other than the early ones like Lisp and so on, they're sort of tied onto an object-oriented type system. And Go does not have that same kind of inheritance-driven object-oriented type system. What it did have was this polymorphism through interfaces. And so the realization was that we could extend interfaces. When I say we, I mean they. I didn't do it. I don't take any credit for it. I'm, I think it's cool, but I'm not taking credit for it. Um, they could extend interfaces to generalize the genericity. And that's pretty much what happened. It took 10 years to figure out how to do it because it's a hard problem. The language wasn't really meant to go that way from the beginning for different reasons. Um, but they are, they work. They are not as feature rich as generics in some other languages for sure, but they're also not done. They just launched last year. So there's a lot of stuff still to come. There'll be a lot of refinement and learning. But one of the things that makes Go succeed, I believe very importantly, is a strong commitment to compatibility over time. The old Go programs still run, so they, as a result, when the generics happened, they didn't get everything right away because you want to make sure you get everything right early on. And if you do everything you can think of, you're going to make mistakes. But if you roll it out slowly as you learn more, you're much less likely to find yourself in a position where, oops, we shouldn't have done that because we can't roll it back once it's out. It's out. I don't know if that yeah. answers the question. Um, let's do a couple more, and then we'll... Better gone to, uh, to our lecture. This is a good one. It's a bit of a long one. Let me try and I think Miguel, you asked this, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, do you want to ask it? Is there, so is the internet becoming more and more 
I think they kind of already are, but I kind of also d disagree with the premise of your question. I don't think it's locked down. I also don't think it ever worked properly. Um, it's not like it's going downhill. Um, there are plenty of public APIs that are really important. Like, for instance, I stopped using Twitter for pretty, I think it should be pretty easy reasons to understand. I've been using Mastodon lately, and that's all on an open platform protocol. Anybody can write the stuff. You get a social network on a completely available open thing. Um, I think that you have a point that there are problems being driven by people locking things down. But it's a very big open source world out there, and the open source community is really good at working around things and bringing it up again. I'm actually pretty happy about it all. I don't, I, don't, I mean, I, I, I understand your question, but I don't really agree that it's the question you should be asking. I think there is an interesting question about what was wrong with the Unix model. Why didn't it take over the world? To do every, you know, every program does one thing and they interact well. Mm. That's a really interesting, I think, um, sociology question. Um, because a lot of people didn't like, weren't as familiar or comfortable with the way Unix worked as, as us early nerds thought. And when programs like Perl, which sort of did everything in one place, came along, um, it, it just seemed to be more attractive. It was like you didn't have to leave the environment. And then the whole web thing happened and pretty much throwed everybody. You probably don't know what HDLC is, right? No. Okay. You've, you've certainly, well, not certainly, but you've likely been on an airplane and you've bought a ticket. If you can watch over the shoulders when they're surfing, in the old days, they had these terminals, these glass terminals, and there was this colored stuff that looks just like you'd expect, where they're filling in forms and buying a ticket. That was, a, uh, that was using a protocol back to the mainframe called HDLC, high, some, high data count link, I don't know, something. Um, and what happened in the 90s was IBM decided that Java was the future. And so they rolled out Java in the back end and web programming in the front end, and they replaced HDLC with HTML and HTTP. And, but they kind of did the same thing. So you're looking at the same thing you were looking at in the 60s. It's just done on a different layer, and probably with a lot of conversion software rather than actually replacing it. Um, and that, the web then, because that was kind of what enabled the web was IBM throwing money into Java. Um, it's, the web pages are all kind of like that now, right? And there was some, there was some reaction to that with JavaScript enriching the, the web experience and so on. But, the problem is that you sort of, you no longer think of the machine as something you're using, but as a remote service you're talking to. And that's such a mind shift, it, even though it goes all the way back to the 60s and the air traffic, sorry, the air tic ticketing system, that um, I'm kind of disappointed how little we've moved. We found out how to make a much, much more expensive, complicated world do exactly the same crap they were doing in the 60s. You know, and uh, that, there's a sociology thing in there that I'd love to study, but I don't have a good answer for why. That's, that, that's probably not the answer you're expecting. That is a very, very interesting thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I got one last question. I really like this one. Um, you worked on lots of different things. One of the things you worked on was the UTF-8 standard, which um, has enabled emojis to be everywhere. Right. <laughs> How does that feel? It's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. When people. When people meet me, they don't know who I am. Like I'm at a party or something. And, you know, what have you worked on that I know about? I said, have you ever seen an emoji? Yeah. And they go, yeah. I said, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I didn't invent emojis, but I, Ken and I did invent the technology that made emojis possible yeah. on the internet. And the first time I ever got, uh, saw, a, I think it was a tweet with Arabic in it. It just, it, it just felt so good. Yeah. We, yeah. we did that because we wanted to make the world a better place. And ASCII is such a scourge. You know, yeah. the idea that you only speak English is such a problem for the computing. I didn't put in a slide about internationalization. I thought about it, but I didn't. I should probably maybe I should have. But I, just another thing about being a professional is understanding the rest of the world is different from you. And, you know, one way that we respected that was by helping to create the standard. In fact, literally, we didn't write the standard. We made the thing that went into the standard. Um, make it possible to deal with multiple languages on the internet. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know what I'm most proud of in my career, but it's very likely that. Emojis. Yeah. <laughs> emojis. Not emojis, per no, se. The type, uh, Bringing yeah. the world together yeah, with, with text on the internet that is shareable and, at that and level. And if you don't understand how UTF-8 works and how Unicode works, and you don't understand text processing in that world, please do it. It is a skill all software engineers should know. It's not easy. I warn you. It's hard stuff. 
but it's really worth knowing how text works because there's no such thing as a character and you need to learn that. Yeah. And, uh, and today's International Women's Day in, in science and tech, I think. So it's, you know, this is something that we want from all of you when you go off to industries, not just to write systems. Anyone, a lot of graduates from a lot of universities can do that, but thinking about writing software in a way that's inclusive and f future proof is, is what we want as well. So on that, thank you very much, Rob. Um, I'm sure we all really appreciate it. I certainly do. Um, do you guys want a, a five minute walk around bathroom break and then we'll do HTTP. <laughs> Speaking of protocols. I don't think I'm going to stick around with No, no, okay. no need. No, is absolutely that, is that not. Right? Yeah, of course not. Yeah, 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 yeah of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. Because yeah. I've tried to write something I could give again if it comes up again. Yeah, no, thank you. That was excellent. It was excellent. Uh, we are so lucky to have you. Yeah, you. we really appreciate it. Oh, thank you very much. It's a weird. Well, I was going to get wine. And Alchemy? I thought, what Alchemy? if he doesn't drink? And then I was going to get chocolates. I'm like, everyone gets chocolates, but it's uh, their. Sort of, you know, nice hands. Yeah, well, thank you very They're much. Really That's nice very kind actually. of you. Yeah. No, really there's no need, it. but I appreciate it. No, thank no, you. thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Can I throw this away? Yeah, leave it here. Leave it here. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, <laughs> he's gonna, he's gonna, gonna get, <laughs> you're gonna get slaughtered. <laughs> yeah, that was excellent. hard to write cloud software, server software.
Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. When I was uh, working at an AI institute, one of our projects was they would put cameras above the cribs in the hospital for newborns. And they would look at, so yeah, you build these skeletal models basically. So like a human is basically lying. So it's like, here's a lion, here's a lion. Like what you were saying, here's a lion. And, you, and then basically, you know, if you do like this, the skeleton rig sort of follows and then you can track what a human looks like. And they were doing that in um, cribs to detect certain diseases and, and things that were only, they would change how babies move. Like so, but it all comes from this. Have you ever played the Xbox or like the... the no, they're actually using the same one. Yeah, we better, sorry, come on. We don't, otherwise we're in the formal house. But yeah, I promise you. Okay, yeah, it's all right, it's all right. Yeah, of course. You know, we haven't spoken about it yet, and I usually do. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Oh, uh, maybe that was actually a good question for Rob. I'm going to step, step over. Yeah. Yeah. Can I give you a room back? Sorry, do you have a question? Uh, oh, no, no. Yeah, like, kind of, I was like, well, I really asked you professional that you have a, like, I have a long story about a question, yeah. story, but I don't want to do it in the middle of this class. Yeah. But it's very important to understand. Um, here's the way I look at it. In any place I am, today I was obviously supposed to be the yeah. expert, right? But I, what I want to be in is where I am the stupidest person yeah. in the world. That's the best way to learn. So if you feel that people around you know more than you, that's a good thing. That means you're going to learn. That's a good way of putting it. <laughs> that means you're going to learn. The mic back. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it means you're going to learn. That's a, it's a great way. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing is, I just you, you experience it a few times, and you're like, oh, I need yeah. to sort of. I was like, I was like so afraid of everything because yeah. I, I feel be. like I'm the only one like struggling with it. No, right. and, like, and you're not. Shaking. Everybody. Yeah. Yeah. That's if exactly they're right. not, yeah. then they're probably true. And and you look at you look at the forum. There's 700 students in the course. Yeah. Only the students that know a lot of yeah. things are going. Right. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, we should talk about it more in another yeah, lecture. Yeah. Yeah. Thank okay. You. <laughs> Not everyone. <laughs> okay. This camera, I swear to God. All right, can you hear me online? Well, we've really lost a few, haven't we? Um, tough act to follow. That was, that was um, yeah, we were really fortunate to have someone like Rob come and present to us. I certainly didn't have an experience like that <laughs> in my undergrad, so um, yeah. All right, now we have to get back on <laughs> back onto our regularly scheduled programming. Um, Interesting question. <laughs> that was a bit passive aggressive, Siri. Um, back to uh, yeah, back to our regularly scheduled content. So today's lecture, we're talking about HTTP. Very, very important and useful for the iteration two onward of the project. So that should be enough to perk your ears up. Um, we probably will obviously run out of. Uh, we won't be able to finish the full lecture. I'm assuming. But Yu Chao and I will work something out. Either we'll, pre we'll record a video um, to... I'm not sure oh I my just... God. Let's just take my watch off. We'll either record a video of what we've missed or we'll, we'll, fi we'll figure it out. So don't, don't worry. Um, so maybe we'll get through some of the conceptual side of the HTTP stuff and a, a little demo and then um, we'll, we'll figure out the rest. Okay. So, so far, you've worked on iteration zero and iteration one, right, of, of the project. And all the programming you've done so far has existed locally on your machine, basically, right? So you write code, you, can, you write functions, you call the functions, the functions call the other functions, and what you end up with is this thing we call a program <laughs> that you call and you give it some input and you get some output. All right, we all agree with that. That's, that's a program, typically. Um, but most software you use doesn't work like that, right? Most software you use is are probably websites at this point. Do we agree with that? Um, you know, you go to YouTube, the YouTube server is not running on your computer, clearly. 
It's running somewhere else in the Google data centers. So how do we get your computer to connect and interop with the YouTube servers? Right? The answer to that is, I mean, decades and decades of a lot of people doing a lot of work from networking to programming and, and that. But we're going to focus on one particular slice of this, which is the HTTP protocol, which you will use um, as a software engineer in iterations two and three, and potentially four, to build a system that runs on a client, which is like your local machine or desktop, and a server, which is just another machine. You know, servers are just computers as well. And what that means is you're going to have to use the internet or a network between the client and the server. Um, and what we, you know, when we have a, a system like this, we call it full stack. Full stack basically just means front end and back end. Front end being the local client, back end being the server <clears throat> that's running the server code. What are you building in this group project, front end or back end? Yeah, back end, that's right. But at some point, we, we will actually give you, I don't know if you know this yet, we will give you a fully developed front end. And it's going, because we gave you the spec, it's going to just interact with your back end. So you need to know how that, the, the question really is like, if you've got a, your local computer here, I can't call a function that's running on the YouTube server, can I? I, can't, I don't have access to it. It's not, it's not available. So how do we do this communication? What's replacing that mechanism? And that's basically what we're talking about today. So all of this works over networks. And I don't know if you've done a little bit of networking. And just to put a asterisk here, this is not a networking course. There's a, uh, I've got the course code later coming up. But really, really briefly, what is a network? It's a bunch of computers connected. Um, the way they're connected can vary. But as you know, in our world as software engineers, we don't care how they're connected. We just care that they are connected, right? We don't care if it's copper, ethernet, wireless, whatever. All I, all I know is that I've got a couple of computers, and they can communicate over some protocol. A network could be your home network, just a, a few computers, or it can be the internet, you know, the largest network on, on planet Earth, with millions and millions of devices all networked together. And then you have the World Wide Web, which is um, sitting on top of the internet, but a specific protocol that handles basically what powers web pages. So HTML and all that is served over the World Wide Web. So networks, right? Those, that goes down to the physical layer, like the literal wires, or the, the massive, have you seen the massive cables running under the ocean that power the internet? Then you've got the internet that sits on top of that. That's a bunch of networking protocols, TCP, IP, and things like that. And then you've got web, which is we're getting into software land here. And that's where we're focusing on, whoops, in this, in this course. So yeah, 3331 is the networking. I don't know if it's core in any degree. Um, I always found networking pretty tricky. It's not, my, it's not my thing, like actual networking, switching, routing, and Cisco land and all of that. But it's very, very important. But what we care about as software engineers is that is how we send data and receive data over these networks. Over time, um, libraries have been developed that help us do this very easily. Now it's a few lines of code to send and receive data over the internet. But you know, if, back in the 70s, 80s, it was a lot, a lot harder. We do this, um, so we need some, but um, we need some sort of agreed upon mechanism to communicate. I can't send data to a, a networked computer in some, you know, the Jake format. Like I can't send zeros and ones. How does that computer know what to, to how to unpack those zeros and ones, right? Like we said, you can't just call a function. I need to send a, a, some some messages, some packages. And protocols are how we do this. So all a protocol is, is a, is a universally or pseudo-universally agreed upon way to pack data into zeros and ones and unpack data from zeros and ones. Does that sort of make sense? Um, and as humans, forgetting computing at all, we do this all the time. We've grown to agree upon certain mechanisms. A wave means something to you. 
sodas, a different symbol, um, handshaking, clapping. They're different procedures or protocols that mean different things to us. We have decided what they mean. Maybe in other societies, a hand wave means something different. So there are differences, but you know, the first humans, a hand wave probably didn't mean anything. So we have just grown to develop what this meaning is, just like protocols have developed to, to produce meaning for how data is communicated. And we have different protocols for different uh, activities or areas of, of, of computing. There's a bunch of different ones. I'm not going to even talk about um, all of these. Um, it's crazy. If you send a, a small message over the internet, the amount of protocols involved is, is sort of mind-boggling. Because you have to go from data, which is represented you know, in your program, um, that needs to go down to zeros and ones in your program. That needs to be sent over a wire. That needs to be basically turned into electricity, right? <laughs> and then you've got to go back. And, and somehow, it has to perfectly go back to what I actually sent. If you think about that, it's mind-boggling. Then you've got to think, like, then it's going over Wi-Fi, and someone turned the microwave on that killed a few of those signals, and the protocols have to, have to say, oh, I lost a few packets, and then it's got to go back to my machine, say, like, I lost a few packets, and then my machine has to be like, oh, no worries, here's what you missed. And that all happens instantaneously. It's, it's, it's absolutely incredible. And this is just a snapshot of some of the protocols. Every one of these is, is operating when you send a message over the internet, typically. And lots and lots and lots of work, particularly from big places like Google, goes into optimizing very specific areas of this to get very minuscule um, you know, enhancements so that when you load YouTube, it loads fast enough. It's pretty cool. Some of the protocols you've used is uh, email. Email is a protocol. Um, clearly, accessing the web is a protocol. Anyone used FTP? You're pro now we're probably getting to the point where people don't even use FTP, but that's a particular protocol. Um, so we use a lot of these day to day. You probably you might not know what they mean. But for the sake of 1531, we're focused on the hypertext transfer protocol, or HTTP. Where's the place that you see this all the time? Literally see it. Come on. In the search bar in the browser, you go to a website, you put HTTP. Maybe you don't anymore, but it's technically it, the browser's putting it in for you now. You go www.google.com. You're actually telling the browser, hey, use the HTTP protocol. So you do, we actually, I mean, it's sort of weird, but all most you know, users who browse the web have seen this, at least this acronym before. All right. HTTP is responsible for sending and re receiving HTML documents, but that's not quite true now, um, over a network or over the internet. Um, so really simple diagram. Your browser, you type in an address, that has to get sent to a server somewhere. And HTTP is responsible for part of how that happens. So you're most, um, most likely, if only ever used a web browser to engage in the HTTP protocol. However, that will change in this course. So there's two components we said. There's the back end, there's the front end. They both need to have an understanding of the HTTP protocol, and that's fine. In Node, J JS, in JavaScript, um, there's now a couple packages for doing HTTP. The most common one is something called Express. Um, uh, it's a very popular um, Node library that allows you to run your own HTTP server um, with Node. So what this means is you can write some TypeScript code or some JavaScript code that uses this library called Express, and you can create a HTTP server just like the server that you know is running YouTube. There's at some somewhere there is a HTTP server running YouTube. Of course, it's a lot more complicated than that, but conceptually that's what it's like. And definitely, if you're if you're using a little a small service, there is literally a program that someone wrote in some language that's running a HTTP server. And actually, this is what I meant by it's not a lot of code to get started. 
This is a fully functioning HTTP server in TypeScript. Um, what's the time? 3.45. Do, do we want to see this running? Okay, so this is the exact... Um, This is the uh, exact the same code from the um, lecture slide. Now I've already installed Express, you know, via npm, and I've already installed. Um, yeah, so I installed Express, and we also need to install something called at type slash Express, which allows us to use uh, Express with TypeScript. Um, I think in the labs this is all set up for you in the package.json. So you just run npm install. But pretty simply, you go npm install express, npm install dash dev uh, ex types express. OK. Let's break down, maybe we'll do it on the slides, um, the different components here. So the first thing, this shouldn't be too in interesting. You import the express library, just like you've imported, uh, imported date functions or whatever. right? What we want to do now is create um, the actual web server. And the way we do this is by calling this global um, express function that gets provided by the express library. And we can actually assign it to a variable or an object, in which case, in this case, we've called it app. So app now represents our HTTP server. It's not running yet. At this point, the server's not running but we've created the object that represents a server and that can be started and all of this. We've also created this constant called port, which is just an integer or a number if you look at that. It's literally just a number, 3,000. We'll talk a little bit about ports in a moment, but that's just a number, nothing exciting there. All right. Um, this line sort of doesn't exist necessarily in, in other equivalents, for example, like Python. It's just a quirk of Express where we need to tell it um, the type uh, required in order for the data of many requests to be interpreted. It's basically a little bit of configuration, a bit of boilerplate or a bit of configuration. And there's likely just different ways that an Express server can be started. But um, we're particularly interested in text-based Express. All right, then we get to the interesting thing. So there's a, different, a few different ways uh, HTTP can be interacted with. Um, a very common one is, is the get um, method. OK, so what get does is, is uh, the protocol for saying, how do I um, get information from the server? So, so get is just getting information from the server. It's asking for information. It's one of the four main types of requests. So the way, what we need to do is register what we call a route. So what this is saying is that on my app, which is a server, I want to make a new get endpoint. And the path for that endpoint, and we'll talk about paths in a moment, is just a forward slash. So what this is really saying is, this is like the home route. So when I go to a website, um, or when I, when I go to this particular and um, server, if I give no extra information, right, just a forward slash, um, what's going to be res responded from the server? Less abstract than that. What's, what's the server going to return yeah, from this code? Hello world. hello world. It's going to return the text or a string called hello world. And it's going to package that up according to the HTTP protocol to be sent over the network via in, in this text format, right? That's why we've, this is text. Um, back to the client. We have two parameters here. What's REQ stand for? Request. So this represents or will contain the data that was associated with the request. And that, that includes information like 
what was the version of the browser that was making the request? Or was there any additional information provided in the request, for example? And what about RES? A bit louder. Anyone? I can hear like the word, but it's, come on. Response, Response. thank you, thank you. So th this um, variable represents what I can put in right, to my response. And what am I putting into my response when the function actually runs? I'm sending to my response the text hello world. And that's the rough breakdown of what's going on there. Now, I said we created a server, but we didn't actually run it. So we created the server. I set up an endpoint. Now I want to say, OK, actually run the server. And we just do that with app.listen. App.listen with the port is very important. What we're saying is now, this TypeScript program is going to be listening to port 3000. And that's it, basically. Now it's just going to process the request. Unlike most programs that you write, this program now will not end unless I manually close it. Listen is going to, it's, it's, it has to continue to listen over and over. Does that make sense? Let's, let's see it in action. Um, TS node uh, server.ts. There you go. And it says listening on port 3000. That's the uh, console.log that we've told it to run when the server runs. But can you see here that it's not quit? It's still running here. It's not doing anything. Well, what's it doing? It's listening, yeah, yeah. Which is sort of a weird, we've sort of anthropomorphize our programs a lot. But it's, 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 it's listening to port 3000. This idea of ports, I promise you, is going to trip some of you up. If I don't have ports, what's the problem? There's no ports. So if I don't have ports, what's the problem? Sorry, say that again. Well, port is like a channel. So again, let's pretend we don't have ports. What, imagine what a problem could be. Yeah, let's say. Not quite. Someone's got it in the chat, but we'll give you. Louder, sorry. Sort of. Um, Tiny Lads written, everything gets sent to the same location. The problem is, what if I wanted to run multiple servers? I would have no way of knowing which message was intended for this program versus was intended for the YouTube server program or the other server that I'm writing. So ports are, um, you know, the word is coming from literally the like docks. If you've got one port at your, your ocean dock, Ships are going to arrive. How do you know which ship was meant to arrive? They're all going to crash. The messages are going to crash. So ports are like windows into the networking of your computer. And so every server needs to run on a unique port. So when this server is running, port 3000 is locked and, lo and dedicated to this server. It means if another program wants to run on port 3000, it won't be allowed. So that's, just, that's why ports, ports are very important. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. Whoever run the server first will have access, usually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let, we'll get, that's getting ahead a little bit. Requests are processed in order that they arrive. As soon as the, the program is finished processing a request, it'll move on to the next one that's queued up. Yeah, it, it ha it'll queue it up. But all of that is done for us with the Express Library. All right. So I mentioned a few terms like endpoint, route, blah, 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 blah. Um, 
All of these are related to this concept of an API. Now, you've probably heard the word API a lot, and it means different things in different contexts. Um, an API, or an application programming interface, um, what it basically means is it's the specification for how to interact with my system. That system could be a HTTP server. It could just be a library that you've written in TypeScript. Right? When you imported the date functions library, there was one specific way you could use it, agreed? You can't say, decide your own way to use the library. That specific way is the API of the library. Does that make sense? In the, ter in the context of web and web systems, API basically means what are the possible routes or endpoints for your server. So there's different, um, you can register multiple endpoints for a particular, uh, particular program. What typically, typically happens with websites is you go to like www.google.com and it hits what we call like the default route or the home route. The home route is always a single forward slash. So when you go to google.com, it goes to the forward slash route. The reason is, you know, when you literally go, um, what's an example? You know, you go to like webcms.com slash comp1531. 1531 is a route. But what, what would, if you don't have a, any route, what's like the, the default route? It's just a single forward slash. It's literally that simple. simple. So typically what happens, you go to the, you go to the home route, it does something on the server, and it says like, okay, here's the data you need to display the web page. It might even say, okay, now go to this other route. Like you can do redirects and things. But the point is, we have different routes for different things that return different things or do different things, and um, we need a way um, to define different routes in our applications. These are the four most common types of routes. We already looked at get, post. Post is used to um, give data to a server. So if you type a comment on YouTube and hit send, what type of request do you think it might be? Yeah. You're not getting information. You're giving information. Um, put is very simply used to update something. So if you want to edit your comment, what's that going to be? And if you delete your comment, delete, right? It's sort of make, it's, it's, it's a logical Thing. The reason we need them, if anyone, has anyone looked ahead? Or not looked ahead. Can anyone think why we need multiple types of operations? Why can't I just make, maybe this will give it away, but why can't I just make a different route? Um, why do, so the question was, why do we need different routes? Let's say we're back in YouTube, and you can upload a video, or you can add a comment. I need, I need a way to know, you know, the service does lots, and different, uh, lots of different things. You can post a comment, or you can post a video. So the route would probably be something like slash video, or slash comment. It's not exactly that, but you get the idea. And that leads to why we have these methods. If I have slash comment, do I want to add a new comment, update a comment, delete a comment? OK, we need different operations now for that particular route. There are others. These aren't all of them, but these are the most common. In fact, I don't think I've ever written a server that uses anything else. They're a bit esoteric. OK, we call these four things, post, get, put, delete. Um, this is often called CRUD, and it's literally sounding C-R-U-D. So here's some code, and I know we've, we're at 4 o'clock, so we'll finish up really quickly, that has, it's exactly the same as the, the other server. It's using a different port this time. But you can see there's different routes. There's this Apple route, which is a what type of route? It's a get route. And there's this orange route that's a post route. And you can see there's some code in there, because if you're posting, that means I'm giving information, so we need to be able to unpack that information. 
I'm going to leave this one maybe for you all to run. But, but something, this, I just want to get to one point, right? If I'm posting information to the orange route, you can see here what I'm getting back out of it is this thing called name, basically. I'm getting the name of the orange. How does the, the, the program that posted this know to call it name? What if it called it orange name? What would this program do? It would not find it. So how do, how do, we, how do we know? Yeah, yeah, exactly right. We have to define it in the API. There's, there is no magic answer. The, the person that called it had to have read a manual somewhere that said, if you want to add an orange, here's where you should put the name of it, and this is what you should name the key. In this case, it's literally just name. There's no magic around it. You can't magically figure it out. OK, I haven't mentioned REST. REST is the trickiest thing to define with all of this. Um, you could have endpoints that's called add orange, get apple, right? And everything's a get request, let's just say. Um, but that is not what we would call RESTful. Re all RESTful is is a set of practices on how to form APIs. The reason it's developed and useful is because, you know, I said we need to come up with this um, agreement. You know, I need to know where to put name, right? And I need to know that the, the endpoint is slash orange. However, if an API is, ad is adhering to being RESTful, it's a set of practices that um, helps me just um, be a bit more proficient. So what I'm trying to say here is that RESTful, what, what RESTful means is if you've got um, you know, the YouTube comment example. Um, for example, RESTful will say, name the endpoint the singular thing. So comment, not comments. right? And then you have post comment, uh, at get comment, blah, 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 blah. So it's just a set of like guidelines. That's all it is. And the reason it's useful is if I'm programming and I've looked up the manual for here's how to post a comment, and now I need to think, how do I get a comment? If it's RESTful, I can be like, it's probably just get comment, like slash comment using a get request. So it helps me be a, a little bit more proficient. Does that sort of make sense? But it's, it's nothing technical. It's just how you write the endpoint. OK, here's a slide for it right here. Um, this side doesn't actually quite make sense to me. Does it make sense to you? Um, OK, maybe forget the title. There's nothing wrong with the slide. I just, I don't know, this isn't really describing RESTful. But what I want to point out here is that this is the last thing I'm going to leave the lecture on. I don't even have my watch on. Um, when we return data from an endpoint, and when we receive data from a client, um, we want to send it and receive it as JSON to be RESTful. Now, you've seen JSON before, right? It's when you make an object in JavaScript that is JSON, you can have a JSON file, and it's you know the curly brackets, key, value. That exact same protocol is basically what all HTTP communication has ended up being. So we, we send our messages in JSON, and we, return, we receive our messages in JSON. And it's very nice that we use TypeScript, which uses JSON. Yep, that's right. It's just one of these agreed upon, um, yeah, yeah, we've got to wrap it up. It's just one of these agreed upon things. OK. All right, that's where we'll leave the lecture. There's only a few more uh, things left. Um, Yu Chao will figure out how to <laughs> make up the time. Thank you all so much for coming. I hope you enjoyed Rob's lecture. It was, I really enjoyed it. And I think, I, hope, I don't know, it seems like a lot of the stuff we talk about in this course, he actually sort of hit on the specification, the requirements, um, the working with humans. So that was, that was quite nice. All right, thank you all. Um, have a great uh, rest of the week. Yu Chao will be giving the next few lectures. If you have any, um, leftover questions, feel free to come up to the front. Um, I'll be away for a little while. I'm at a conference for a few weeks, so you've got you, Chow. Thank you.